talk a little bit about follicle stem cells. You know, the regeneration and the use of follicle stem cells for hair regeneration is an emerging uh, trend predominantly in Europe. And in Europe, they are uh, currently studying uh, the administration of follicle stem cells back into the areas of hair loss or hair thinning uh, with some interesting results. You know, we don't have any good uh, studies yet, but I've seen some, some interesting clinical responses, some positive clinical responses. Um, you know, follicle stem cells, um, when you think about them, uh, there are different populations of follicle stem cells that uh, are located at different regions on the hair follicle. For example, the CK15 positive stem cells are located approximately 0.8 millimeters to 1.6 millimeters below the surface of the skin along the hair follicle. And the uh, CD34 follicle stem cells are located more at the bulb or the base of the follicle. So the average follicle is 4.2 millimeters in length. Uh, they can range anywhere to from less than uh, four millimeters in length, down around 3.8 millimeters in length, all the way up to six, 6.2 millimeters in length in some Asians. So the, these follicle stem cells, different populations, uh, lie along the follicle at different levels. Now. Uh, in studying follicle stem cells, what we looked at was a minimal depth approach to extract the follicles. And in doing so, uh, we were able to leave some of the CK15 positive stem cells in the donor area. And the reason for this is simple. When a punch enters the skin at an angle, uh, or a needle enters the skin at an angle, uh, the inferior bottom edge of the punch is going to incise deeper than the superior margin of the punch. And for this reason, uh, we're able to leave some of the CK15 positive stem cells in the donor area, even when we cut to a depth, uh, total depth of three millimeters on the inferior margin, we're oftentimes under two millimeters uh, on the superior margin. So we leave this population of CK15 positive stem cells in the donor area, and then we basically pluck the hair follicle out. Plucking it out leaves the CD34 positive stem cells, and all the stem cells below the area of the incision are left in the donor area. Now what we did originally was we administered a cell into the donor area, and we studied the uh, response. And what we found was that the uh, we were able to get follicle regeneration. And not only did we get follicle regeneration, we got better donary healing. And in our ongoing study, we found that we could not locate an average of 48% of the extraction sites following the administration of A-cell into our FUE procedures. Well, we then retrospectively went back and, and compared this result to the uh, number of extraction sites we could locate uh, when we didn't use the A cell, and what we found was we could find 1% more extraction sites than we noted in the chart, which meant that on average we took 1% more uh, graphs than we noted in the chart uh, to achieve the result we were after. And uh, uh, then we studied uh, uh, the application of a photo-initiated liquid gel that we applied to the donor area to try to trap that A cell in because our thought was that the A cell might be leaking out when the patients lie down, put their head on the pillow or whatever. And so we wanted this insoluble uh, gel uh, membrane, bandage if you will, liquid bandage over our extraction sites to trap the A cell in place. And what we, we found in that particular study was that 42% of the extraction sites had follicle regeneration. And all of the extraction sites healed flawlessly. We couldn't locate the extraction sites even when we compared them uh, to uh, preoperative images. Uh, it, it, it donor area looked fantastic. So then we repeated the study, but this time we incised much deeper. 
And in doing so, we did not leave the CK15 positive stem cell niche in the donor area, and our follicle regeneration was only 17% of the extraction sites. And it was quite interesting that very few of the transected follicles on, in either the control side or in the study side regenerated. In fact, out of all the transected follicles, there were two on the left, which was the uh, control side. One actually regenerated, and that was not the A-cell side. It really wasn't a regeneration, it was just a regrowth. But on the A-cell treated side, we had two transected hair follicles, but we were unable to get either one to resume growing. So, you know, we, we were sort of stuck with the A-cell. And uh, the best we could do, in my opinion, was an average of around 30, 35% of the extraction sites to regenerate hair, and an additional 18, 15% of the extraction sites on average to heal, uh, such with revascularization and, and normal uh, pigment without hypopigmentation, so that we couldn't locate them. So we were on this 48% of the extraction sites we couldn't locate, and we didn't have another idea. I did have one, and that was to uh, use a, an enzymatic digestion of the hair follicle to release the stem cells uh, from some of the grafts that I harvested and to actually add this to the extracellular matrix before we put it into the extraction sites. Um, but I didn't go with this because it's a little worrisome to get the, this many progenitor cells uh, in, um, in a product that you, you might re-administer the donor area. So I came across this process in Europe where they're using a mechanical process to create follicle stem cells. And in doing so, um, we can take follicle stem cells, the entire length of the hair follicle, and put them back in. So we can add these with our PRP or our platelet lysate because we really are far more advanced than PRP. We don't have PRP anymore. We're a step ahead of that. We have platelet lysate with five to eight times the concentration of growth factors that you get from PRP in the best PRP kits available from the best doctors in the world. That's the best they can do. We're five to eight times better. So we, we can add them to the PRP. We can inject them back, these follicle stem cells, back into the area of hair loss and hair thinning. But what's very exciting is to add these, these follicle stem cells into our extracellular matrix gel that we apply into the donor area. And we currently have some studies cooking where we're looking at the potential of regenerating even more hair. Now, uh, here is an example of a, a young lady who had uh, the follicle stem cells injected into an area of alopecia areata. And you can see that two months later, she has significant regrowth. Uh, now, alopecia areata can resume growth on its own. So we can't necessarily uh, uh, say that, um, that the uh, follicle stem cells induce this, but it is highly suggestive. Um, We've also seen some interesting positive responses to follicle stem cell injections into the area of hair loss. So it's a, it's a new, uh, highly interesting, exciting way that we might medically uh, improve coverage over time. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, I think there's a great potential that we can get more follicle regeneration in the donor area following follicular unit extraction. Uh, so uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we've got some studies cooking where we're combining the follicle stem cells plus PRP, where we're uh, adding the follicle stem cells to our extracellular matrix and applying this into the extraction sites. And uh, we're also, something very interesting that we're working on is the use of microparticles. You know, the microparticles will basically replace the ASO because the only benefit to ASO plus PRP is an extracellular matrix where the growth factors can set up and you can get a little bit of a sustained release in addition to a sudden burst of growth factors from the platelet-rich plasma. We're taking our platelet lysate and we are incubating this with uh, microparticles that we create in the lab and the microparticles absorb some of the growth factors from the PRP, platelet lysate rather, and we re-inject this into the areas of hair loss and thinning now 
to get not only this huge burst of, of five to eight times the concentration of standard PRP uh, growth factors, but also a sustained release over a period of a week uh, where we constantly hit these hair follicles with uh, concentrations of growth factors that uh, uh, can help promote antigen. And what we believe the platelet-rich plasma does based on our studies is that it, it takes the telogen hairs, the resting hairs, and pushes them back into the growing phase. And it takes about six to eight months to see the improvement in hair coverage, sometimes up to 10 to 12 months. But what happens is these hairs that have been resting are forced into the antigen phase, they resume growth. And then the question is, how frequently should we continue to give the platelet lysate to keep those hairs in the growing phase? But the other thing that's very interesting is that we actually have an increase in hair density in the areas that we administer the, the platelet lysate. And so it's the numbers and the length of the hair that are giving the improvement in the degree of coverage. Now we see an, on occasion an improvement in diameter, but quite frankly, most of the time it's just an increase in number and increase in length. All right, so stay tuned.